Hello class and welcome to This Week in Brain and Behavior. This is our capstone lecture where we try to bring together into a clinically significant uh, space all the things that we've learned up to this point and try to make it meaningful for you. Now, uh, because I want to emphasize the fact that this is something that's actually the kind of practical, meaningful part. Uh, I didn't want to put the pressure of having you being tested on this part, and that's why um, we're kind of just going to leave this as its own thing. But I want to kind of highlight that this brings meaning to all the things we've covered up to this point in the course, because this kind of evaluation that we can do with clients, people that we're working with, uh, really goes a long way to using all of the information that we've been exploring up to this point in the course. Now, normally what I will be doing is, is I teach uh, professional counselors. And so normally when I teach this, I'm kind of explaining that you can do this kind of test to kind of evaluate a client and whether or not there needs to be a referral, say, to a neurologist or a general practitioner, medical practitioner or psychiatrist. And uh, so that's kind of the general purpose here. It is The intent here isn't to make you experts in evaluating psychiatric uh, disorders, but uh, Hopefully you will see as we go through all of the aspects of the psychiatric and neurological mental status exams that there is a lot of things in there that are pertinent to this course. And the other thing I want to kind of highlight here is that uh, there, both the neurological and the psychiatric are brain-based uh, evaluations and studies. And so... Uh, what, however we divide this up, it really is just brain-based stuff that we're evaluating. So I want to kind of keep you to keep that in mind as well. Now, as we dive into the mental status exam, the whole point here is to help you to get a, a better understanding of an individual's psychological state, including any potential psychiatric or neurological conditions or disorders that they might be experiencing. So, on the overall broad perspective here, we're evaluating their cognitive and emotional functioning and keeping in mind both psychiatric and non-psychiatric factors. Now, as part of that, we will be you know, delving into, you know, how can we make informed judgments about an individual's mental health? and identify some potential issues and formulate some then some appropriate treatment plans or referral plans for these people. And that kind of ties in with the whole mental status. And now, in order to kind of make sense of all the components of a mental status exam, uh, particularly the psychiatric portion of the mental status. And in, in this lecture, I'm going to be dividing it up into the psychiatric and the neurological. So the first part of the lecture will be psychiatric and the second part will be neurological. And you'll be able to tell very clearly. Uh, but the first part, you know, with the psychiatric mental status exam, uh, a, a nice, easy, helpful mnemonic that I found is in what is ABC stamp licker. And uh, this kind of harkens back to the olden days when, when you would use a postage stamp, you would have to lick it. Nowadays, you just peel off the back and it's already sticky and you put it on your letter for those few of you that actually use the postal system. But just so you are aware of kind of the mental image of where the ABC stamp licker comes from. Now, each one of the letters in the mnemonic ABC stamp liquor represents a key feature in items that should be covered in a mental status exam. Now, you don't necessarily need to do it in this order, 
but it helps you to ensure that you are covering all the kinds of things that you should be having in mind as you are visiting with a client in order to uh, make a determination whether or not they require possible referrals to another professional. And so let's go through some of these, the components of the ABC Stamp Liquor and what we'll be covering in this part of the lecture. And then we will dive into each area in its own specificity. So we start off with appearance and then there's behavior and cooperation. So those are three things that you need to kind of be evaluate within a person. And that's your ABC, then our stamp, and that would be speech then thought content and form, then affect, which is the external expression of something, then mood, which is the kind of the internal emotional state of a person, then perception, which is how do they kind of perceive the world, and then level of consciousness. Uh, you know, are they comatose or are they alert? And that would be, so, oh sorry, that would be stamp, and then Liquor would be level of consciousness, then insight, then cognitive function, then knowledge, then ends, as in, you know, uh, suicide or homicide, are there any thoughts about those types of ends, and then reliability is the reliability in this information. And that is our nice, simple mnemonic of all the things that we should be covering within a mental status. Now, Let's dive into each area in a little more specificity, shall we? So we start off with appearance. Now, appearance refers to that visual and physical characteristics of an individual when they present themselves for this kind of assessment. And so evaluating appearance can provide some valuable insight into an individual's mental and emotional well-being. Now, to be clear, we're not evaluating, you know, are they pretty or not? we're looking for certain components that may indicate uh, deviation from health. So the first thing that you would look for is, you know, uh, do they have good health, and, or sorry, good grooming and hygiene? And so this includes observing whether they are well-groomed, have proper personal hygiene, that they're dressed appropriately for the occasion. And so any deviations from expected grooming and hygiene standards can be indicative of certain psychiatric conditions. Uh, for example, a severe decline in self-care, such as not bathing or wearing disheveled clothing, can suggest things like depression or schizophrenia. Uh, the choice of clothing may also offer some clues. Uh, for instance, wearing inappropriate clothing for the weather or for the situation might signal a lack of judgment or a disorientation. Uh, conversely, someone dressing in a very eccentric manner may indicate a very manic state or a psychotic state. And also, it's important to observe an individual's physical characteristics that can reveal potential signs of medical or psychiatric issues. For example, weight loss, uh, a noticeable change in their physical appearance uh, can suggest underlying health problems or perhaps an eating disorder. You should also be mindful of a person's posture and their motor behavior. Um, agitation or restless movements can point to things like anxiety or mania, while a slow and lethargic movement could indicate depression or certain neurological disorders. And also it's important to just look at the person's face and for the expressions in the person's face. A lack of facial expression, you know, what we sometimes call a flatness of affect, and we'll get to this a little bit later, but that's, uh, you know, just a lack of, of real emotional expression can provide indications of a mood disorder or schizophrenia, as well as expressions that are incongruent to the situation may be indicative of that. So in terms of neurological and psychiatric aspects, uh, evaluating an individual's appearance can 
be helpful in detecting conditions like major depressive disorder, uh, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and even some neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, where changes in grooming and hygiene and overall appearance might be quite noticeable. Then there is the B in ABC Stamp Liquor, which stands for behavior. And here we can kind of start with overall general behavior of the individual. So you can look at, okay, are they agitated? Are they restless? Are they fidgety? Are they lethargic or slow to respond? And so general behavior is indicative of various psychiatric and neurological conditions. Uh, as we mentioned, restlessness might be a sign of anxiety or mania, while slowed movements could be associated with depression. We're also interested in cooperation. And so be mindful of that. Uh, eye contact. Is, does the individual have good eye contact? Is it sustained and appropriate eye contact that's typical uh, for someone or is it very inattentive is it kind of avoiding eye contact and that can be avoidance of eye contact can be indicative of things like uh, social anxiety or psychosis or some other conditions speech is a, another thing that can be along these lines just more generally um, it, what's the rate of their speech and we'll kind of get into that in a little more detail later on um, is there any indication of self-harm is there in injurious or destructive behavior that's going on and that can provide us some insights as well into the type of behavior that's going on and uh, evaluating behavior is particularly vital with things like uh, bipolar disorder schizophrenia, major depressive disorder, anxiety disorder, and also some uh, personality disorder, say for example, antisocial personality disorder, or obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Then we have cooperation, and here we're kind of being... Uh, looking at overall, you know, are they apprehensive? Are they reluctant to engage? Are they anxious about this whole process? Are they open? Are they eager to engage? Is there an initial willingness to participate within the process? Is there cooperation? Uh, is the individual ready to discuss their thoughts and feelings and experiences openly? Um, does the individual have the ability to answer questions, to provide information and express their concerns or symptoms that are crucial for an accurate evaluation? Do they have the ability to follow instructions? Uh, are they able to keep on task? Can they do cognitive tasks? Are they actively engaged in the process? And that's a positive sign of cooperation. Uh, cooperation is particularly important in psychiatric evaluations because many individuals with mental health conditions may feel vulnerable or distressed or guarded. Uh, so, for example, someone with uh, anxiety disorders can have a high level of anxiety and that can hinder their ability to cooperate due to their heightened nervousness or fear. There are certain psych psychotic uh, disorders. So delusions or paranoid beliefs can make individuals less willing to cooperate. Uh, substance use disorders can influence uh, a person's cooperation and the reliability of the information they provide. There can be some personality disorders that involve difficulties in forming rapport or cooperating with uh, clinicians. And of course, Depression, uh, mood disorders, uh, for example, can lead to a sense of apathy and a reduced interest in trying to cooperate with someone. So that all of these things, you just need to kind of be mindful. They're nice and simple. So appearance is nice and simple. Behavior is nice and simple. Cooperation is nice and simple. But they provide a wealth of information that can feed your intuition and guide you through the process of evaluation. 
Then we come to speech. So we're now on the word stamp. And so with speech, we're interested in uh, a lot of things about speech. You need to kind of be mindful that your left hemisphere is where speech is. So the only way we're ever going to be able to kind of carry on this kind of evaluation is if the left hemisphere is working. But then we can use that to evaluate, well, how is everything else working within the person? So we're looking for the rate of speech. That's one thing. So rapid pressured speech, for example, may be associated with manic episodes, uh, which we can see oftentimes in bipolar disorder, while uh, slow halting speech might be observed in depression or certain neurological disorders. Uh, the volume and tone of the individual speech uh, can be important aspects. So loud or aggressive speech may indicate agitation or anger, while a soft or whispering tone may suggest fear or anxiety. You know, is there clear and coherent speech that indicates organized thought processes? You know, conversely, speech that is disjointed or incoherent or tangential can be a sign of a thought disorder. Uh, and that's something that sometimes we see in, say, for example, schizophrenia. And the content of an individual speech can reveal a lot. Uh, delusions, uh, hallucinations, or obsessive thoughts can be evident of the content of the speech. Uh, additionally, word choice or language disturbances or neo neologism, so made up words, can be in indicative of various psychiatric disorders. You also need to look for thought blocking and flight of ideas. So thought blocking is a sudden interruption of speech where the individual is unable to continue their thought. On the other hand, a flight of ideas involves a rapid flow of connected but often unrelated thoughts. Both of these can be associated with disorders like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. In some cases, individuals may be non-responsive or mute. And this can be due to uh, things like anxiety or depression or you know other mental health disorders that can be neurological or psychiatric abnormalities that have to do with uh, the left hemisphere, for example. But there can also be problems to do with, like, for example, with schizophrenia, there can be disorganized speech. With mania, there can be rapid pressured speech. Uh, with aphasia, and recall from our class, there can be disturbances in speech. We could uh, either have Broca's or uh, where Nikki's aphasia, and then those can uh, cause disruptions as well. But those would be a little more easy for us to identify since we've taken this course. Now, uh, we get to thought. So in the word stamp, we're looking at thought, content, and form. And here we're just looking for, first off, are there delusions or false beliefs, fixed beliefs that are resistant to reasoning or contrary evidence. So common delusional themes include paranoid delusions, so believing others are plotting against you, or grandiose delusions, so you have an inflated sense of your self-importance, or somatic delusions believing that you have, for example, a medical condition when there's no evidence of it. Um, so those can be disturbances in thought content. Uh, you can also have obsessions, and obsessions are intrusive, repetitive, distressing thoughts or images or urges. And we can see these in things like obsessive compulsive disorder, and they can have a significant impact on a person's mental health. There can also be uh, thoughts of self-harm. So, for example, suicidal ideation or harming of others. So, homicidal ideation. And that can be crucial for assessing their psychiatric status and may require some immediate intervention. There can also be uh, ideas of, say, for example, thought insertion, uh, where it's a belief that external forces are planting thoughts in your head or... Thought withdrawal is the sense that thoughts are being taken away from you. 
or thought broadcasting is the belief that one's thoughts are being broadcast to others. All these kinds of thought content are really indicative of things like schizophrenia. And then we have the forms of thought. What are the forms of the person's thought? And these can give us some insights into the kind of disorders one might be seeing as well. So, for example, uh, thought blocking, which we've mentioned a little bit of already, where the individual's thought process is interrupted abruptly, uh, leading to a sudden silence in the speech. And that can be a sign of uh, a thought disorder that we can sometimes be observed in schizophrenia. Uh, there can be tangential thinking involving going off on a tangent, never returning to the original point, making it difficult for an individual to maintain uh, coherent conversation. Uh, there can be circumstantial thinking, which includes excessive unnecessary detail before finally arriving at the main point. And it can seem be seen in individuals with uh, conditions like, for example, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, there is also a flight of ideas. So rapid continuous thoughts that are connected, but you know, they still change quickly. Well, that's something that is often associated with the manic episodes of bipolar. And then loose associations. We can kind of think of loose associations in the th form of the thought as being uh, where there's just a very, there's a lack of logical connection between thoughts. And this causes the conversation to seem very disjointed or incoherent. And so loose associations are a feature of uh, thought disorders that are part of the whole schizophrenia perspective. So overall, as far as thought goes, it can be really valuable to keep in mind thought content and form in evaluating the psychiatric health of somebody because you're looking for, okay, is there um, information that might lead us to in the direction of schizophrenia, bipolar, major depressive disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, that type of thing. Then we have A and M, and we're going to kind of bring these two together because they kind of connect together a little bit here. And that is affect and mood. And affect and mood are two critical components in assessing an individual's psychiatric mental status because it provides some insight into the emotional and psychological aspects of their well-being. So what is affect? Well, affect refers to the, an individual's outward expression of their emotional state. So it can vary in terms of intensity and appropriateness. And clinicians often observe an individual's affect during their just a simple conversation. So we're looking for things like, with affect, we're looking for things like, okay, is there flatness of affect? Is the affect blunted? Meaning that there's a limited range in the emotional expression. Uh, oftentimes that will be an indication of schizophrenia or sometimes certain mood disorders? Uh, is there inappropriate affect? That is, when the individual's emotional expression doesn't match the situation, it can be considered inappropriate affect. So, for example, laughing when you're discussing a very sad event might be an indication of emotional dysregulation. Although, um, when someone has stress Sometimes they will laugh in, as a way of uh, relieving that stress or they'll smile or giggle. And it isn't, it, it's just kind of an emotional release. You kind of have to distinguish between those two. There's also, you know, is the affect restricted or constricted? So what is the range of the emotions? And when you have a limited range of emotional expression, that's often something that you will see in things like depression. Uh, what is the lability of the affect and as far as is it characterized by rapid and unpredictable shifts in emotions and this can be seen in conditions like borderline personality disorder or mood disorders then there is the mood and the mood is the internal state of the individual this is kind of the individual's predominant emotional state 
which is typically more sustained than the affect. So the do they have an elevated mood, for example, which is excessively cheerful and optimistic? That can be observed in, for example, manic episodes of bipolar. Or are they in a depressed mood where they are persistent sadness or low mood? And that can be a hallmark of major depressive disorder. Are they irritable? Are they in an irritable mood where it's associated with anger and frustration? And that can be part of uh, psychiatric disorders, um, particularly uh, certain personality disorders, um, antisocial personality disorder, a borderline personality disorder, that type of thing. Uh, is there a dysmorphic mood where they're, which is kind of characterized by an unease or a restlessness or a general dissatisfaction? And often you see this kind of thing in anxiety disorders. Now, the thing to kind of really, one of the great values of affect and mood is what you can do is kind of just use your bodies to pick up on. Is there congruence between the mood and the affect? Um, so, and, and the way you do that is, is pretty easy because affect is something that we automatically catch from people. So when we're talking with someone, our bodies are great sponges. And so they're going to make us feel the way they feel. Generally speaking, particularly if you're a counselor, you usually have a very good sense of, of the emotional state of somebody. And so you're automatically going to pick up on their affect. And then, so that's, they make you uh, feel the way they feel when you're open to it. And then you just simply reflect upon it on, and you ask them, okay, how do you feel? And if they say, well, I feel fine, I feel good, I feel happy. And yet their mood, uh, their, sorry, their affect is something that is very negative or flat or that sort of thing. And they're giving off that vibe, then they, you can just kind of say, okay, well, those th two things don't match. And probably the easiest way to do it is just take a bit of a break uh, during the conversation, step outside the room, and just kind of reflect upon for a moment how do they make me feel and how do they say they feel? And do those things match? If they don't match, if there is a mood affect incongruence, that's a red flag. And you can go, aha, there's probably some kind of psychiatric disorder going on here. Maybe it is schizophrenia, maybe it's something else, but it's something that deserves a, a deeper look. So, affect and mood, very important things to kind of be mindful of. And we're looking for congruence. And when there is incongruence, then we can say that there is something more that needs to be delved into here. Then we can go on and look at perceptions. What are perceptions? Well, perceptions are the individual sensory experiences, how they interpret and respond to the world around them. So we're evaluating the perceptions, and that gives us a sense of kind of how they're working with the world. So auditory hallucinations would be a disruption, obviously, in perception. And this would be, you know, hearing voices, hearing noises, hearing sounds that are not actually present. So auditory illusions are often seen in conditions like schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorders. And sometimes, sometimes uh, certain mood disorders. Then there's visual hallucinations. And this is where you're seeing things that are not actually there. And this can occur in conditions like schizophrenia, sometimes with things like bipolar and also sometimes with uh, the be the result of certain substance use. There can also be olfactory or gustatory hallucinations and now these are less common than other hallucinations but sometimes you can smell things that aren't necessarily there or taste things that aren't really there and these can be associated with certain neurological conditions or psychotic conditions so it might uh, involve a little more investigation. Then there's illusions, and illusions are misperceptions of real sensory information. So, for example, an, an individual sees their shadow and interprets it as a threatening figure, for example, would be 
uh, an illusion that can occur with certain psychiatric or neurological conditions. And then there's a sense of, you know, depersonalization or derealization. And depersonalization is the feeling of detachment or disconnection from your own body or the self. And an individual can, uh, may feel like someone's watching them from the outside. Or derealization is that sense that the external world is unreal or distorted in some way. And these can are conditions, you can see these things in you know, schizophrenia, you can see them in PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. There can be disruptions, basically, that can take place. Uh, certain psychotic uh, features of bipolar can also be associated with this. So it gives us a sense of something to look for. Then there is levels of consciousness. And probably the easiest thing to do here is uh, do what's called a serial seven test, uh, where you you know start someone at a hundred and say, okay, count down backwards from a hundred by sevens, and so they'll you know they'll go down and do that. But sometimes that can be hard. But clearly they're not going to be able to do that unless they are highly alert and conscious uh, but sometimes they're just not good at math so that sometimes isn't the best test another thing you can do is something called the one tap two tap test where basically you say okay i'm going to count i'm going to tap the table once and when i tap the table once you tap the table twice and when i don't tap the table or when i tap the table twice you don't tap so it would be kind of like okay and then I don't tap so that kind of thing would be a way of doing that now you can kind of evaluate someone on the levels of consciousness so Obviously, if someone can do that, do the one tap, two tap test and don't get it wrong, then obviously they're conscious and alert and you're carrying on a good conversation with them. They're fully awake and they're aware of their surroundings. Uh, there could also be, though, some altered con consciousness. So there can be confusion or disorientation or uh, reduced awareness, a stupor or a coma. There can be a lack of orientation. Um, so probably the easiest thing to do here to evaluate orientation is to just welcome them at the door. Okay, did they get to the place by themselves? Did they get there on time? Uh, offer to take their coat or whatever. And then you can just evaluate from that. Are they oriented to who they are? The oriented to person? Are they oriented to place? Did they do they know where they are, and did they get there on time? And if you have all of those things, then yeah, and it can just be part of the conversation. You don't have to sit down and write forms, but you can evaluate a level of consciousness and their orientation to person, place, and time, nice and easy, just by carrying on this conversation. So the just like everything else, you're looking for things, but you don't necessarily need to. Uh, be, you know, asking specific questions about them. You can just be checking them off as you go through. The next thing is insight. And we'll, we'll add to that judgment. Now, insight refers to the individual's awareness and understanding of their own mental health and behaviors and presence of any psychiatric symptoms. And so we're, we're evaluating, first off, do they have good insight? Do, are they an individual that has good insight and they're aware of their condition and they understand the impact of their symptoms on their life and they recognize that they have mental health issues and that they're engaging in it. So that would be the ideal. But oftentimes you'll see individuals with partial insight. They may acknowledge some of their symptoms, but they may lack a complete understanding or minimize the significance of their condition. And then there's poor insight, which is often characterized by individuals who are unaware of their condition. They deny that they have any symptoms. 
and they attribute them to external causes. And then along with that is judgment. So we're evaluating, you know, does someone have the ability to make uh, good judgments? Now, as far as insight goes, a lot of that has to do with, uh, uh, you know, the functioning of the percutius. Because uh, that gives us this, the ability to self-reflect. And then judgment, and particularly making good choices, has to do with a certain part of the uh, frontal lobe that uh, helps us to make good daily choices within life. So, do uh, does the client have good judgment? Do they make good decisions that are reasonable and adaptive and align with their own well-being as well as that of others? That would be the ideal. Oftentimes, you have someone with impaired judgment where they have inconsistent uh, sense of reality or they're going to be irrational or do risky decisions, sometimes harmful or outright harmful decisions. And this then has to do with, you know, does this person need additional help? Is there risk there? Uh, is there safety concerns about risky or dangerous behavior? And this then will, will tie into, okay, what's the diagnosis or prognosis for this person? Do they need extra supports? That type of thing. Then we go on to cognitive function and sensorium. So cognitive function refers to the individual's mental abilities related to thinking and reasoning and memory and problem solving. And so obviously something to do with memory is going to be, you know, those different types of memory, uh, sensory memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, working memory. So a nice, easy thing to do to kind of test for uh, Short-term memory is just get them to do a little task like the one that I use is just to say, okay, remember this sentence, Bill and Bob went fishing and Bill caught three black bass. And then I have them remember it. And then a few minutes later, I, I ask them, okay, you remember that sentence? And maybe I'll start it off by Bill and Bob, and then they'll finish it, went fishing and Bill caught three black bass and good. Then there's no problems with memory. Memory seems to be working well. Now, evaluating memory involves assessing an individual's ability to recall also past events, experiences, and information. And so impaired memory can be seen in things like dementia or delirium or post-traumatic stress disorder. So you need to kind of be mindful of that. Uh, is their attention, are they able to sustain their attention and concentrate? Um, difficulties with impairment of attention can have to do with uh, ADHD or major depressive disorder or delirium. And also need to kind of be mindful of overall executive function. And that can be seen, disruptions in executive function can be seen in bipolar disorders, schizophrenia, and uh, numerous neurodevelopmental disorders. Then, of course, there's sensorium, and that kind of ties in with the uh, level of consciousness that I talked about earlier. So, you know, do they have level of consciousness? Are they alert? Are they oriented to the world around them? All of that kind of ties in with our overall sense of their psychiatric well-being. Then we come to knowledge. And knowledge is the context, in the context of uh, psychiatric evaluation, it really relates to the individual's general fund of information. So this is largely their knowledge about the world is, the, is a left hemisphere activity. And the right hemisphere activity is knowledge about personal experience. So we're evaluating the knowledge about the world. So we would ask them some historical facts, their general information about the world. They don't have to be historical experts, but do they have a general sense of, you know, how the world works and how, uh, say, for example, you know, when did the United States become a country? That sort of thing would be a nice, easy one. Or when did Canada become a country? general things like that 
And we could also look at their educational level, their background information. Um, does that uh, correlate with what we're seeing? And uh, also their uh, awareness of current circumstances. You know, who is the Prime Minister of Canada? Who's the President of the United States? Those types of things, are they uh, able to uh, know how to prepare a meal? Uh, what are the steps for that sort of thing? That kind of information goes a long ways to help in understanding knowledge and uh, helps to differentiate between psychiatric disorders and conditions that are primarily uh, affect cognitive functioning, such as uh, neurocognitive disorders and that sort of thing. Then we have ENDS. So here we're looking more at the kind of morbid things uh, like thoughts of suicide and homicide. So suicidal ideation refers to thoughts and contemplations of self-harm or suicide. And this can range from, you know, passive thoughts about death to specific plans and intentions to end your own life. And so assessing the presence and severity and specificity of suicidal ideation is crucial for, obviously, for the health of the client and the care of the client and also for the intensity and, and severity of possible disorders, as well as homicidal ideation, which are thoughts of harming or killing others. And it's essential to determine whether these thoughts are fleeting whether they're related to anger or if they involve specific plans to harm someone. So we're there we're looking again for, is there risk to somebody else? Now, the thing you need to kind of keep in mind is um, mental health professionals have a, a right to uh, bring someone to a hospital if they believe that they have a risk to themselves or others. And then uh, they can even be held against their will. Uh, in a healthcare setting, if it's deemed that they have are a risk to themselves or others in an imminent sense, so you want to kind of explore in there as well. You know, is there intent? Is there planning? Are there any safety concerns? What are the risk assessments of this? Do they does there need to be some uh, protective factors? Are there appropriate social supports? Do they have a history of attempts of suicide, for example, or a history of violence? Those are always good predictors of future behavior. So things to be mindful of there as well. And then reliability. We will all, of course, want to ensure that we have a little bit of information about the person from outside of the, uh, the, the this one conversation so that we have a way of assessing the truthfulness and honesty of the individual statements. Are they providing us with accurate information or are they being deceptive and untruthful? As well as, is there consistency? Is there reliability over time? Is there collateral information that we can obtain from uh, previous medical records, for example, that may verify the accuracy of the information that the individual is giving us? All of that goes a long ways to this as well. So overall, that would give us a good sense of the kinds of things that we would look for in a psychiatric mental status exam and give us a good sense of uh, whether or not there needs to be a referral out to a medical professional uh, in the psychiatric setting. Now, I want to go on and look a little bit at the neurological side of this, the neurological exam. And here we'll look a little bit at the cranial nerves, at motor exam, a sensory exam, exam of coordination, as well as a reflex exam, because of course this has to do with the brain as well. So let's dive into the cranial nerves and let's start off with the first cranial nerve. Okay, remember the olfactory nerve that runs along the surface of the front frontal lobe. And this is important because this whole region can suffer from a significant tumor and will not show any symptoms except loss of smell. So uh, simply ask them to close their eyes and inhale and tell what they smell. So you could say, for example, have a cup of coffee or some soap or toothpaste, place it close to them. And if they smell it, great. Then their first cranial nerve is likely fine. 
unless of course they have a cold or something and can't smell and you need to kind of be mindful as well that older people also lose their sense of smell so that can be something that you need to be mindful of here then there is the second cranial nerve the optic nerve and here you look in the person's eyes you can also look for uh, sun setting uh, where the the uh, iris is drooping down and that can be caused by pressure in the optic nerve uh, you can also use uh, you can peer in and see like if you have an ophthalmoscope peer in and see the pulsation around the optic nerve see if it's okay if it's healthy uh, you can check for do they have an, a normal uh, size of blind spot and you can do that by say for example have them hold their eyes on a target and cover a certain eye and then move a pencil across and tell them when they can't see it and if their eye spot if their blind spot is very small great then you can go on but if the eye if the blind spot is getting larger then there may be uh, say for example some intracranial pressure with the that is increasing that blind spot they might need a referral to a neurologist then we can kind of lump uh, cranial nerves three four and six all together and because these are integrated controls that move the eyes and the eyelid the extraocular muscles so in this test, you get the person to hold their head still and you get them to look at things without moving their head. So look at the ceiling, look at the floor, look from right to left. Uh, and another way you can do that is to hold your hands at a distance uh, on one hand with uh, a finger up, on the other a thumb, and you just have them move their eyes between the two and so this test is a test for eye movement so it's just looking for is there pursuit uh, now if a person for example is experiencing double vision that's a result of the eyes not moving together and so that can uh, be a sign that there's a disruption there then there's the fifth cranial nerve and that serves uh, the function uh, it actually serves many functions but for screening purposes we test for sensory function so chewing muscle control and so you can just have them run their hand over their face or better yet uh, have a, a little plastic toy and run it over their face slowly and ask does that feel natural on both sides along the forehead and down the cheeks and people with sensory loss will usually indicate some place where it feels funny. Uh, so you need to kind of be careful not to be too sensitive unless there's a big difference. Then there's the uh, cranial nerve, the seventh nerve, uh, which is the facial nerve. And this is if there is trouble with uh, your facial nucleus the or, or of the facial nerve then the muscle will be weak so you get something like Bell's palsy and it also influences our sense of taste it tastes metallic and it will influence the anterior part of the tongue so there are also small muscles in your ear that stops the vibrating in your ear um, so when they become weak you start to hear a ringing in your ear and an ache behind your ear and again that can be associated with Bell's palsy then the eighth cranial nerve and there's two parts to the cock to this cochlear part and having to do with hearing and the vestibular part and so the the best context for understanding this is in the context of dizziness uh, but really we're kind of just looking for you know is there uh, yeah uh, is is there dizziness that's going on and that can give us a sense of what's going on with with the eighth cranial nerve then we have the ninth and tenth cranial nerves and we're going to lump these together as well and here we manage the 
sensation at the, the back of the palate and the gag reflex. So if they have a natural gag reflex, then that's perfectly fine. And we don't need to, to worry too much about it. Um, now, sometimes what will happen is there can be some variability in that. And if a person is constantly clearing their throat, they're aspirating, then there can be something wrong with that gag reflex. So if they're constantly going, <clears throat> <clears throat> then we need to kind of be mindful of that. Then the 11th cranial nerve, that manages two muscles, the, the one that turns the head and one that shrugs the shoulders. And so just simply ask them to shrug their shoulders and look for any weakness. And if one shoulder goes up before the other, uh, and ask them to turn their head to the right and to the left. And you can you know maybe even put your hand on one side of the head and give a slight bit of pressure and see if they're able to do that with strength. If they are, great. If there's some disruption with that, then you can look at the health of the 11th cranial nerve. And then the 12th cranial nerve is the hypoglossal muscle. So the tongue has, uh, there's two muscles that are part of the hypoglossal uh, muscle on the tongue. And if one of those is weak, then the tongue will kind of go off in a certain direction and you'll get kind of a thick sound. So uh, there you're just kind of looking for what's the tone of the, of the speech. If the speech is talking like this and it's very thick with the talk, then that just means that, just means that uh, the tongue is weak. And so you can look at the 12th cranial nerve with that one. Then we come to the motor exam, and there's three parts to the motor exam. Um, really what we're looking for is their overall tone, bulk, and power within the motor system. Uh, you can tell the person to relax and move their arm and their head normally, and you know look for any kind of resistance there. If it is, has, if there's increased uh, tonicity with that, then uh, that can be pathological. So we call this hypertonicity or stiffness, and that's associated with movement disorders. Bulk, we're looking for, do they have appropriate muscle mass for their body? Uh, and are, and then power is, is it weak or not weak, left or right? Is there disruption with that? And that has to do with, obviously with, uh, part of your, uh, motor cortex in that. Uh, now, the thing to kind of keep in mind with tone, bulk, and power is that everybody's a little bit different and there can be some great variability in activity. So probably the easiest way to test for this is simply to give them a handshake when they walk in the door and place your hand on their forearm, one hand on their forearm and while you're shaking the other hand. That way you get to feel if there is appropriate bulk in their wrist. And if there's tone, because you can, if it's a really stiff handshake and then there's going to be hypertonicity, you're going to catch that right away in power. You know, is there appropriate power? Is there appropriate strength in their handshake? And all of those things are nice and easily can be done instantly with a handshake. So you can evaluate the motor exam, tone, bulk, and power very quickly as part of your natural conversation with someone. And that gives you a sense of what's going on in the uh, motor system. Then we have our sensory system. Okay, remember the parietal cortex. And here there's the primary modalities. You know, do they have sense of the different parts and then the cortical modalities are they basically are they able to interpret the code that comes from their sensory system so for example you can get them to close their eyes and place a penny in their right hand and without looking at it and they feel it can they tell you that that's a penny and then you put a pen in the other hand or can they tell you that that's a pen if they can do that then great then you have done your sensory exam and you've evaluated remember the contralateralism that is within the brain and we're evaluating the uh, the parietal lobe then we have our overall test of coordination now here again we don't have to do anything really complicated we don't have to make them do a dance 
because walking, uh, just having a normal gait, is an incredibly complicated activity and is a great test for motor coordination. And it helps us to test the pons and cerebellum and that there is good coordination there. And you, the other thing, so if just walk in, when, when someone walks in to the room, you can evaluate their walking. If they have good normal gait, then you can say, good, things seem to be fine with their pons and their cerebellum. And uh, the thing you need to kind of be mindful of is if you have elderly clients, they tend to have smaller steps. But other than that, there should be good gait. So, right off the bat, when someone shows up at your office, you are already evaluating for all sorts of things, psychiatrically and neurologically. You say, hello, your name is, and then you're testing for, you know, their orientation to person, place, and time. Did they show up on time? You're shaking their hand, putting your other hand on there. You're doing your test for tone, bulk, and power. You're... Also, and then when they walk into the room, you're evaluating for uh, neurological evaluation for coordination. So you're doing all sorts of things instantly as you're going through this process, working with someone. And so, again, I just want to highlight that you don't necessarily have to be doing all of these in a very formal sense. But you do need to cover all of these areas in some way to give a good accounting of um, the need for possible need for referral to other people so that you can um, ensure that you are serving your client as best as possible when they come in to see you say for example for counseling and when you've evaluated all of that and have a good sense and you can say okay good you know, we're not worried about any of that sort of thing now we can get down to the business of, of working in counseling as well and so I just want to uh, end there and remind you that while sometimes it may seem that neuroscience and brain and behavior are not relevant to life they are immensely relevant to life and they are essentially a core part of who you are and how you live your life. And so I encourage you to continue learning about this area. And I want to thank you for a good semester. You guys have been wonderful students. And uh, if any one of you wants to go on to do graduate work, please do not hesitate to uh, ask me to be your one of your academic references for this. Best of luck in all that you choose to do in your life and just enjoy the fact that you are fearfully and wonderfully made and that you have a responsibility to care for your brain and your behavior. You take care. Bye-bye.